Hi, this is Derek Harp, the founder and chairman of CSA and the host for CSA Online. And you're here for another uh, after Wednesday at one o'clock seminar uh, regarding the evolution of OT security management uh, with Rick Kahn. Rick is uh, a longtime friend of, of CSA, one of the very, very first chapter presidents in Calgary and uh, has always been uh, helping in every way that he can and uh, is a, a founding fellow of our fellows group. And so it's always exciting to have, uh, have someone uh, like Rick on the show. Um, and he's been in the industry a long, long time. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, get your Q&A, definitely get your questions in because he can really uh, talk about a lot of different aspects of, uh, of, of uh, OT and ICS cybersecurity. Um, okay, so as we normally do, uh, we like to knock out a little bit of research and, and just perspective, uh, but, and also inform Rick sort of a little bit about, it, about his audience. So here's a quick poll, um, just finding out uh, how long you've been working in this industry. Now, Rick, uh, I know you're probably muted, but uh, how many years uh, have you been focused on this particular part of cybersecurity? Firstly, uh, about 21 now. That's what I thought. I, I knew it was a long time. To, it, you can't go back much further than that. Um, it would have been more exotic for sure if you go back much further than that. Yeah. All right, it looks like a bunch of people are uh, sharing here. Um, not completely even distribution, but every single uh, time frame is getting some participation. Oh, they're sort of normalizing. They're getting closer to each other. At least three of them are. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share where we are now. This is pretty cool. So here, uh, here are the results. So there you go. More than 10 years, 25%. So that's that's uh, definitely. Uh, more veteran, and then we've got a whole distribution of people from uh, not, you know, not in it yet, but uh, we know we're, we've always got people that are coming to look, and they're they're just now getting into it, or thinking about getting into it. We hope these are really useful, um, but then folks that are at every step, um, these exchanges of information and ideas and concepts, uh, we hope they continue to be as valuable to uh, to you as they have been in the past. And uh, Rick certainly is a great uh, speaker towards a lot of these ideas and things that all of you probably are, are working with. Um, okay, so if you haven't joined us before, we are a 501c6. We are a nonprofit workforce development association. Uh, we're focused on the OT, ICS, Industry 4.0, cybersecurity workforce. And so that's the individuals that are charged to secure systems that have cyber physical elements, pumps and valves and actuators and moving parts in uh, all sorts of industry applications and verticals. And we're not just thinking in terms of the omnipresent or maybe the or, or sort of original mature sectors of gas and oil and energy, but building control systems and medical systems and traffic lights and all sorts of systems that we all rely on in our everyday life and in our corporations to work. And uh, now they're, they're uh, either they are networked or they are increasingly being networked if they aren't already. And, uh, and that makes them vulnerable, right? We get a lot of efficiencies and great new functionality, but we get a lot of, uh, of new risks based on that connectivity. And so the folks that are trying to secure those uh, are, um, are have a challenge. They need to understand multiple disciplines, and uh, that's a, you know harder to find people that know uh, enough about control systems and operating technology and ICS or and cybersecurity and uh, and, and IT related functions. So uh, again, let's keep rolling. Um, so we've had about twenty five thousand people sign up uh, over the last uh, seven years, uh, and which they continued to you know every quarter more and more people. The problem is global. Uh, the regional approaches can be different and government programs can be different and board level or sea level buy-in can be different geography by uh, geography basis but the problem is uh, is truly uh, global we are able to offer these free events uh, educational events due to the financial support of our strategic alliance partners we could not do this uh, without them and um, it, you know, if, if you work at one of these companies, thank you for supporting the workforce uh, via via CSA. Uh, and if you're not involved with this already and your company would like to be, there are more ways than ever. We have lots of different program uh, involvement levels at, at all different uh, price uh, appetites uh, based on sizes of organizations. You know, we, we're really able, able to now um, fit a lot of people in and help them and help the community all, all, all at the same time. So thank you to our strategic alliance partners. So today is a seminar, our seminar format. Uh, that is the 90 minute format that we typically do Wednesdays at one o'clock. Um, and we will issue continuing education unit certificates or CEU certificates for those that are active for at least an hour or more. 
Um, and that should just happen automatically within 24 hours of the event. If you ever have an issue or a question around this, you can email our dedicated email, ce at cs2ai.org, um, and we'll, we'll try to address it. This episode and about 30 more episodes have been modified for CEU On Demand. This is a global member benefit. It is not free. Uh, it has a cost or is free for global members. Uh, but this is where you can go in 24-7, any time of the day or night or weekend, and you can watch some of the uh, amazing learning videos from previous years. And uh, we've embedded a keyword mechanism that you can record in a form and, uh, and prove that you, you watched it and get your CEU certificate uh, automatically without any human intervention. So we're excited to finally uh, be able to offer that. Um, and that is one of the membership benefits of a global membership. Uh, we do ask people to consider buying the global membership. These events will remain free. It's uh, in our foundation many, many years ago that we want everybody to come get this information. We want people to be exchanging ideas and talking, and we don't want cost to get in the way of that. And so our sponsorship model allows us to do that, but our growing source of additional support for the nonprofit is membership, and it's very inexpensive. In fact, it's $129 a year. If you're an educator or a student, all the same level of access is $39 a year. And when that's our sort of tribute to you and helping support that uh, part of our ecosystem as well. So there will be more benefits. Uh, the CEU On Demand is just the first one that's reserved for global members for free. Um, and then the mentorship matching program that uh, the committee is working right now on uh, will come out probably maybe late this year, but certainly for, for 2023. And that'll also be only eligible for global members. And you can still lock in this price I'm not sure whether we'll you know, increase the price, but we have sometimes uh, on an annual basis. Um, so right now for the rest of the year, we'll, we'll keep it steady at 129 and then evaluate things uh, at the end of the year. So consider a membership, please. Um, yeah, and so one of the things you get as a member, uh, just a reminder, is all the recordings uh, going all the way back to 2018. So it is a treasure trove of recordings from, from some amazing, uh, amazing speakers. All right, let's do our, uh, one more poll before we uh, get going here. And um, so this is sort of looking at where funding comes from. It's something we're examining with our annual report um, and we do ask about it. And so we're doing sort of spot checks as well during the year through some of these mechanisms, uh, looking at how budgets are formed and where they're formed. I and mean, the purpose of this is sort of to be able to synthesize that data and repurpose that, share that back with you as sort of lessons learned from all of you. Um, and as long as we get enough statistical you know, participation in all of these polls and surveys, we can gather some, some interesting conclusions. And um, so this is sort of uh, re-looking again at, um, you know, at where, where money is flowing from um, for this area. Um, it was interesting, our annual report this year noted that the significant increases to budget, 20 and 30% over last year, decreased. Whereas a moderate increase, 10% increase to last, three, last year's budget increased. So it was uh, sort of sort of interesting. There might have been a little bit of a pullback from the significant increases, um, but there's still steady, um, at least evidence of steady growth to some degree in, in budgets. Um, unfortunately, not not all respondents are getting getting more capital for their program. All right, let's close this out and let's share this, and you can see just a little bit of where this uh, where this came out. So there you go. That's that's very interesting. Again, a lot of uh, not equal weighting, but a somewhat close distribution between all the different uh, options on that question. That's definitely something we'll be um, looking at closer uh, after the event. Thank you for um, participating. Um, okay. I uh, want to just do a quick reminder about the uh, podcast. Uh, it is gathering a huge amount of momentum, and we're, um, we're now really doing our best to drop on every Tuesday a new episode. Uh, we're getting lots of feedback, a lot, a lot of listeners, and these are people's biographies. Um, this is sort of the, the OT cybersecurity biography channel, if you will. Um, and um, it's, it's now we're approaching getting near 50 biographies of really interesting, diverse people. Um, and we're, we're continuing to add to that. Um, if you think your story should be considered, you know, email us at input at csa.org and get in the list uh, for consideration. Um, this is, uh, you know, sharing best practices, ideas, things they did that worked, things that they didn't work on their career path. Um, and uh, people are telling us it's been, uh, for some people, inspirational and useful and others just darn interesting uh, to hear um, how people ended up where they are and what, the, what their journey looked like. Uh, you can join up. We are forming multiple committees. The Mentorship Committee will have its first meeting next month and has five current members, a very interesting group of individuals. Uh, there will be two or three other committees forming over the rest of this year. Our goal for 2023 is to have four 
functional committees working on behalf of all the members. And so there will be some benefits for committee members and some things we'll try to do for you. Um, and so again, you can email get involved at CSAT.org. If you did that in the past and you have not received a communication from us, then just send another email to that. And well, let's make sure we've had some staff, um, new staff join and a little bit of staff change over the last 12 months. And so it could have gotten, you know, maybe, maybe your interest in being on a committee got lost and I would hate for that to be the case. So we'll give away prizes again today. If you've not joined us before, this is for submitting a quality, what we call a quality question, a question that Rick can answer, a question that everybody gets to benefit from. It's as if we're in the same room, we're sort of simulating us all being, you know, raising a hand, having a discussion, which we can't easily do this way, but you can put a question in the question bank that this program, uh, the GoToWebinar offers, and then I'll pick from those as best I can, as many as I can uh, for Rick, uh, and that enters you in the prize wheel. And that's why we give away some prizes. It is to create and stimulate that discussion and not just, uh, uh, you know, death by PowerPoint, if you will. Um, so please get those questions in early. Uh, at some point after the top of the hour, we'll, you know, we'll run the prize wheel. We'll still do some Q&A after that, but we'll have already um, already done the prizes. So Rick, uh, would like to welcome you to the stage and um, I will uh, bow out once you are there and I've passed you control. All right, and you are now the presenter. Thank you. Let All me right. switch to what everybody wants to see and not my ugly mug. There we go. Uh, can you confirm you're seeing my screen, Dirk, before you meet? Yes, yeah, looking good, Rick. Take it away. Sir. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and thank you uh, also for the opportunity to share, and I hope that I, I bring some interesting observations. A couple things of note. Um, this is a bit of a reflection on my personal opinion that I've, I've held over multiple jobs in the 21 years I've been here uh, in, this, in this industry. Um, it is, uh, you know, informed of, of through my very obvious experience, firsthand experience through particular avenues. But um, it's funny because, again, no matter where I've worked, I've worked for three major, uh, you know, OT type of uh, vendors um, throughout the years, which I'll talk about a little bit. But it's it's uh, the one thing that always strikes me as odd is the underlying challenge is that we just need to clean up our mess. Um, and so, you know, there's there's lots of aversion to it, even some of our vocal friends with trade shows that, that you know openly question why would we ever try to reduce risk or patch systems and their answer is because we're at risk without it um the other thing i wanted to quickly point out um so that's sort of my tone hopefully to, for today is to share a little bit about what i think we really need to do and what, what i'm starting to see some organizations embrace and, and the success they're having in it um the second thing is that i noticed in the in the budget uh, well, the first thing is your first poll is that there seems to be more and more people been here longer. That's great. We're getting more people than they've been around for longer. Um, we, what I noticed on the second one was that the lowest budget source of all of them was OT, which is, I found somewhat interesting. Um, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but, you know, we talk about people that say they don't know if they have a budget or they're not sure that they have one. Um, I today continue to run across people, uh, two of them this week that I'm speaking to, major organizations that, um, know they need to do something, but have no idea what it looks like or how big it's gonna be, and have never to date spent a dime in it. So anything is going to be infinitely more than zero. So there's there's for some some learning and some some growth pains for some of these organizations. Anyways, I digress. Thank you for the opportunity in the platform. My name is Rick, as Derek has pointed out, and you heard, if you are here early enough, you heard that I've, I've been, you know, uh, in and around this industry for about 21 years, um, the last seven of which with my current company, Verve. Before that, I spent considerable time with a company called Matricon and eventually Honeywell. <clears throat> Honeywell acquired Matricon. Uh, and in my travels, I've had the, the, the pleasure of seeing everything from, you know, Saudi Aramco post Shamoon uh, to, you know, mom and pop paper mills in, in rural Ontario or the backwoods of Canada. Uh, and hope they can share some of those lessons and, and experiences with, with this audience today. Um, Verb itself is actually an interesting um, organization for me. Absolutely nothing against the vendors and the OEMs. <clears throat> Matricon was a vendor neutral. Honeywell bought us and were very vendor specific. And so now to be back with, with uh, a vendor neutral client in, in Verve is really cool. The second cool thing about it is that we're actually founded almost 30 years ago as an automation vendor. So we've got a lot of OT experts on the team. We do DCS programming, PLC upgrades. We are still in, in operating facilities. And about 15 of those 30 years, we've been deploying, you know, security solutions, both services and software. Um, and today I'm going to try and make sure that everybody is sharing from case studies and success stories and not at all a product pitch. Um, but there are some 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 biases when you've been doing it for 20 years and seeing the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, nonetheless, how do I want to frame this out today? Uh, I'd like to start by how did we get here? 
Um, it's a very interesting clash of two cultures that sort of created this mess. And now trying to figure out who should clean it up is, I think, what the biggest challenge is. One of the one of the hugest debates, you know, in the last couple of years, it seems to have died down recently, but I'm sure, sure it's simply due to lack of energy rather than the fact that it's resolved is, you know, what is IT, OT convergence? Who should own the solution, IT or OT? Um, I'm still firmly on the fence. <laughs> As a Canadian, wanted to be polite and not offend anybody. Uh, no, but in reality, um, uh, you know, to me, there, there's, you have two different worlds, each with their own input, and therefore you need two different perspectives. We talked about it in the lead up that, you know, the unicorn is the person that knows both sides. The purple unicorn is the one that can actually be effective, and, and those just really, really are quite rare. And so the answer is that we need to work together. Uh, a little bit of a history, you know, there were a couple of attempts at the silver bullet. Like I said to my opening note, um, we really just need to roll up our sleeves and clean up our mess. Uh, but unfortunately, too many attempts to try and avoid that. I think are slowing us down, causing noise, causing confusion, and wasting time and money. Um, and then I want to put a reality check in uh, about why trying to dodge the work is, is just not feasible. And then I have a, a case study, uh, what the future can look like. We've got a client that um, that uh, measured before and after in adjusting their approach, adjusting their methodology, adjusting their visibility, building a converged ITOT team um, with some semblance of automation, the ability to outreach and gather data, but also act on it. Uh, and what the, the real benefits are. And then, of course, questions. As Derek said, you know, there's there's uh, some skin in the game there. If you ask a cool question, uh, you might just take some home today. So how do we get here? I know this is potentially boring history lesson, but it is important. Um, when I first burst onto the scene, um, I burst on, when I first joined the scene, we were seeing a rapid expansion of so many traditional vendors throwing you know, TCP IP and plug and play technology. And because it was so promising, um, we're gonna get to see data, we can react faster, we can be more advanced in our analytics, we can get more out of the process. And so many, many vendors, you know, jumped in um, with with wanting to plug and play information and systems in there into their into their control in, in environments and they're with, with varying levels of success, but also some very interesting challenges. I mean, I joke that TCP IP is, you know, is a, is a try and if you fail, try again. And it's multiple retries. It's really only about 30 to 40 percent bandwidth actually gets through, which, you know, philosophically speaking, seems pretty pretty uh, um, counterintuitive that you're in a in a um, a very dependable, uh, consistent, and required to be con um, uh, always on environment that you put something in that's by nature uh, quite comfortable with failure and retries and <laughs> and dropped packets. Um, but nonetheless, the, the plug and play TCP IP is introduced and, and challenges happen. I remember distinctly being flown all the way to Broken, Blow, Broken Bow, Oklahoma, which is an interesting place to be, uh, to one of the most complex and newest uh, OSB mills building an uh, oriented strand board or the, the press board plywood. And what had happened was the Simple Camp team had brought in their 3M presses, or sorry, they're, they brought in their, their new press equipment and their, and their PLCs and their temperature and thickness measurements. And then upstream from that was a brand new set of switches, a 3Com put in, and then a new HMI, all with this new TCP IP. The challenge was that the, the Simple Camp guys originally grabbed a packet. I know this is very technical, but I thought I'd share. Um, and they, they decided that the BGP packet, the Border Gateway Patrol packet, was a pretty interesting one to do. And so they grabbed it and started using it. But the problem is they didn't understand what BGP really was. And so when it got to that new 3Com switch, it said, oh, you're BGP. Well, here, tell me this information. I will use this wonderful new routing protocol to get you where you need to which of course the simple camp equipment had no idea what was being asked of it. And so the 3Com, as by its design, just simply dropped every single packet from that IP address. So my job was to fly all the way to Broken Bow, Oklahoma, to dig around for a little bit and essentially make the 3Com switch as dumb as it possibly could so that it would ignore the BGP and the packets would get through. And this is just one tiny little example, but it is an example of the clash between the two environments, right? So really the takeaway on this slide is we have a very slow moving, very steady environment <clears throat> that expects you know, a regular drip of data from one direction than the other uh, to be able to take care of data and to bring in uh, information for trends. Um, and we're putting this very dynamic you know, new age technology and especially technology has a two to three year refresh rate. You see that second bullet, Honeywell has an oldest install award at their user group. I was there when I worked for Honeywell and I saw one of our clients get a 30 year award their oldest first system installed by Honeywell had aged to 30 years and was still successfully creating oil. <clears throat> Fantastic for an investment perspective, a nightmare from a technology and a security perspective. 
there is a lot of proprietary space in here when you look at the simple camp and even some of the other vendors i'm not picking on them because of them it's just because of my particular experience um there's a lot of proprietary stuff in there and a domain controller isn't always a domain controller if you get further down the produce stack and get into vendor based uh, uh re-releases of, of domain controllers and hmis and of course, many of our organizations have a mix of materials and equipment through acquisition and divestiture. Um, Coal-fired generation is probably the worst, but we're seeing more and more manufacturing that are picking up smaller mom and pops, and they're now inheriting multiple uh, vendors to go ahead and navigate this system with. So the result, 20 years later, OT does not have new technology. We put stuff in and we leave it behind. Uh, we still see Windows 2008, Windows 7, and Windows XP. Um, I actually had somebody ask me yesterday if I can help with his NT. And I said, <laughs> if that's your biggest problem, if NT is the majority of your platform, you've got a pretty big problem. The other challenge with OT is that by bringing TCP IP in, like the simple camp press and the temperature sensors, we now have three classes of assets that we need to worry about, not just OS and networking, which OT do, or IT does. We have all these, what we call embedded, so relays, POCs, controllers, variable frequency drives, et cetera. The other challenge is that OT has a dire consequence to loss of visibility or access, which everybody knows, but it can't be overstated. Um, what does an hour of downtime cost? Every single operator or someone who's aware of operations on this call knows what an hour of downtime costs. And it's not necessarily just the product. I have a pipeline client that had an outsourced IT team <clears throat> thoughtfully and proactively patch a, a Cisco firewall um, and reboot it because it needed to, to take, for the changes to take effect. The problem was, that was not properly labeled as a critical OT networking gear. And it took down the path for safety uh, information to get to the leak detection team. Um, so out of an abundance of caution, they shut down the lines. Um, and it wasn't necessarily the product that didn't move, of course that added to it, but the eight and a half, eight, eight figure penalty or eight figure um, cost of that outage was as consumed by filing with the National Transportation Safety Board, internal analysis, uh, stopping production, taking people off their day job. Um, it's a really big deal to get back to normal. We can't just count the outage, we need to count the, how does it take to get back to normal? Um, OEMs unfortunately often place significant barriers on approved behaviors. Now that's a, an older one. I think that that's, there's, there's pockets of resistance in the older school, uh, you know, older generations of controllers and operators that you know, they, they've, they've lived for 20 and 30 years side by side, the, the plant manager and the vendor that's, that supports them. Um, and so to potentially disrupt that relationship uh, tends to get some backs up pretty quickly. Um, we're seeing more and more OEMs starting to really step back and say, look, we can't keep up with security. Um, let's just work together and solve the client's problems. But unfortunately, there's still pockets of, of resistance. Um, OT staff are not typically trained in IT. Uh, here's the other one. OT staff is usually outnumbered by assets. Um, one of the things that shocks me or that I find it shocks you know, the corporate side is that not only have they never spent in this space, they don't know how big the problem is. Uh, and there's usually hundreds or thousands of assets on the OT side and sometimes they far outnumber what's on the IT side. There's, a, there's an energy company in my home city of Calgary that has uh, you know, a certain number of assets, but they have 150 IT people and they have exactly one OT person despite the fact they've got six processing facilities. I guarantee you that that OT staff is 100% outnumbered by the, staff, the assets in his environment. So the conclusion is that OT security is just like regular IT, but you have to have one hand tied behind your back and by the way, you're gonna wear a blindfold. <laughs> Not necessarily that dire, but the reality is we need to start making progress. We don't have the time to sit around. Um, I joke that as soon as people start to get it, my simple understanding of this topic um, is going to put me out of a job. But for now, when I go to trade shows and conferences and say some of the basics and people still nod their heads and take notes, it's because we're still finding people that are just getting started on this. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these since I've covered some, but I want to hit some highlights. Um, I don't do FUD with attackers, but the reality is ransomware um, is very lucrative for the bad guys to go and find that pipeline company that can cost tens of millions of dollars in an outage rather than trying to just get a mom and pop manufacturing facility to give back their, their blueprint for the, uh, for the plastic widget they're shipping in a box of uh, Weedabix, right? Um, the, the target that you are, the amount that you would suffer publicly and professionally as an operating company is making you a more attractive target. Um, we've already covered IT being a great part of OT systems. Regulation continues to evolve. I hate the carrot the stick debate because I hate to beat someone with a stick, however, it does at least move the needle. Um, we have a lot of TSA requirements, a lot of pipeline companies jumped on board. 
Um, it's not, again, the best way, but at least it's a start. Um, resource constraint. Vulnerabilities and threats grow, and we do not get to add staff. We once deployed with a client a solution, and they were told, well, now you need to just help us manage it because we have an operational budget freeze for 10 years. We cannot add any headcount for 10 years. Insurers, I cannot tell you how many organizations are phoning saying our insurance premiums doubled and our coverage was cut in half. Um, it's starting to come to the corporate boardroom and this is gonna get more and more attention. And if we don't sort of pick our path, it'll be dictated for us. And of course, directors were not wanting to be on a headline or a part of a company that got owned in a big bad way. So the common objective though, no matter what we do, and of course within the regulations and best practice and industry guides, there's no shortage of guidelines. There's an SCSF, there's an IEC 6443, which is based on ISA 99, there's NERC SIP, there's a TSA regs, there's the NIS government governance in, in the UK and, and emerging in the Middle East. Um, no shortage of checklists or guidelines to help you in your journey, but the, ba the basic objective is to apply security controls, meaning we need a risk-based approach. And a little observation, there were recent adjustments to the TSA requirement. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. TSA came out with standard for pipelines. I'm sure many are. Um, but then they came out with a, an addition recently where they basically backed off a little bit on some of the requirements because when you strictly say thou shalt without uh, any sort of uh, acknowledgement of the environment you're trying to do this in, especially when it's complex and as varied as OT, you will invariably have all sorts of exceptions. Um, and that's my point there, that, that sometimes the work that you're doing to secure the asset may not be worth the effort. However, it doesn't mean we can just carte blanche, ignore everything in that environment. Now, the two other things that are real kicker that many, many people make the mistake about is that we need to be able to demonstrate that we've actually applied the security controls and the risk reduction, and we need to be able to maintain it. Um, I have a client I'm talking to who had a, a professional services organization come out and apply a whole bunch of configuration changes and tuning to the systems. They were trying to get to least privileged system hardening. Um, and they had a checklist and they proposed to the client, here's what we're going to change and here's what we're going to tune and we'll track it all in this lovely spreadsheet. We'll make sure it all gets taken care of. And the client said, okay, great, go do it. They ran around the countryside all over their install bases, logging into all their systems, doing all these tuning and parameters, et cetera. They came back and said, look, we're all done. Congratulations, you're, you're least privileged in all your systems. And the client said, great, how can I tell? And the answer was, well, you need to log into the system and look for a particular setting. Um, and they said, well, how do I know if it changes? I said, well, you'd have to log in and look for it. So there's no way in that scenario to actually look. It's like the king and the emperor had new clothes there. Um, the reality is that if you don't watch something, it will tend towards chaos. Um, it's uh, it's it's a it's a proven fact. Uh, we've gone to sites where we've you know and, and way back when I was in Matricon, we we do a project, we'd hand over the new system, we'd high five each other, the project team would go home. Nobody was trained, nobody looked into the systems, nobody managed it. We went back six or eight months later, and it was as though we'd never done anything because half the security was undone, the patches weren't updated, new ports and systems had been opened, new users had been added, new software had been installed. Uh, we just generally went backwards. So use a risk-based approach to apply controls demonstrate that we've applied them and maintain their status over time because things will change. The challenge in those three is properly grasping the risk itself. Um, everybody knows that risk is likelihood, likelihood times impact equals risk, right? Well, when you get to OT, everybody argues the likelihood um, in general. I've never been hacked before, so why should I worry now? The impact is something that's a little bit better and easier for OT to get their hands around. They know when you talk to the operators, what systems are critical, which systems are redundant, which systems you know we're worried about, et cetera. But both of them require a significant amount of OT information. Um, likelihood can be compounded when you look at a threat risk. For example, a network-based attack. If you're all the way down on layer two of the Purdue model and it's a complex attack with minimal impact, Maybe you're not as worried about it as if it's a, uh, a network-based attack in the DMZ. So for OT, the likelihood and impact become things that are a challenge to calculate. And I think this is where we start to get to um, some of the uh, complacency or the in a, in lack of desire to jump in and roll up the sleeves and start uh, you know, digging deep and, and fixing these risks. Because OT is, as I mentioned earlier, like the picture on the right. IT, we can make everything Windows 10. 11 and we have a project to update everything and then if anything happens we send mid a ticket to IT and they maybe re-image my system and I may lose the morning but I get an extra cup of coffee 
and I can get back to work and maybe just stay a little over my lunch to get caught up. Um, in that environment, we have all Windows 11. We can patch on Tuesdays. Everything is pretty cookie cutter and straightforward, like you see on the left. And so there's not a lot of concern for deviation. It's easy to spot. Uh, it's also easy to manage. OT, on the other hand, is like the picture on the right. All sorts of weird and wonderful, unique, uh, very important, very fantastic uh, devices. Uh, one of my colleagues on my team likes to call a lot of operating facilities we go to working museums. We've got old school systems, we've got new systems, we've got some strung together, and we have a wide range of varying uh, challenges and, and systems. The reality though, is that when I need to actually understand risk and impact, I need to be able um, to pull um, very specific OT information into the analysis. And I borrowed this, if you notice two slides ago, I had a reference on there for the, uh, uh, I'll go back to call it out just because I wanna be conscientious. This is uh, an example from the API with the American Petroleum Institute with part of that you know, TSA stuff we're talking about. And there is a full webinar on some of their specific API 1164, if you're curious, this is a slide from it. There's that link if you'd like, very informative. informative. Um, and then this one is actually from the IEC 6443, the IEC 99 patching committee. I, I realized I hadn't put it on the image, but if anybody wants it, I'd be happy to forward it after the fact. So the IEC 99 committees are a bunch of like-minded OT engineers that build you know, various guidelines about how to architect and how to manage. And one of the ones they built was for patching, you know, patch decision criteria. And if you look here, one of the first things we need to do is identify the vulnerability and, and is there an available patch? It's a great starting point. The very first question we ask ourselves, though, is does it even affect us? And you notice if the answer is no, we don't touch it. Now, <laughs> that's not necessarily ideal. I'm arguing for a slightly different approach, but this is the typical behavior, right? Now, the next question, though, is if it does affect the ICS, is there some other option other than patching, right? Again, we're trying to avoid patching altogether. So I honestly understand why we get it. We come by it naturally. If it's a workaround, we schedule that patch as a routine or maybe at a different circumstance or, or, or testing environment. Some clients are telling me their outages are now more than a year apart. So you can see how long we're sitting with this risk. They document what they know and they continue operations. If, however, there's not a workaround, we need to understand is operational need uh, exceed the risk. To be able to understand that though, we need lots of information, right? We need to know the vulnerability footprint itself. As I mentioned, we need to know the impact. If you're not intimately familiar, the National Vulnerability Database, when they submit a vulnerability, they talk about the impact. Does it attack the confidentiality, the integrity, or the availability of the system? There are risks out there that take 100% availability away from the system. In OT, where uptime is king, that's a big risk. Um, what's the exposure? What's the complexity of the attack vector? What is the, the method of the attack vector? Um, how easy is it to deploy, et cetera? So these are all, back to my notion earlier, um, an IT sort of practice around pure threat. But you need to balance that against operational needs and operational considerations. And that's where we absolutely have to have OT involved. That's how we're able to analyze the risk and then make this decision. So um, once we get, and I believe these logic are backward, if the operational needs are, oh no, that's right. If the operational needs are greater than the risk, we probably wouldn't patch or we do because the risk is high enough. The point is, you need significant data, not only about the actual raw risk, but the very unique asset in scope in your environment, its portion in the process, its criticality, its uh, safety nets, its compensating controls. You need so much more information to decide whether to patch or not than you do on the IT side. So what have we traditionally done into this environment? Well, we've gone and built individual tool sets for individual functions, hence my toolbox full of multiple things. Looks kind of like one of my three or four. Um, unfortunately, often these tools are ill-suited for OT. IT likes, especially when you look at IT doing streamlined people, streamlined process, individualized expertise or special specialties, and then mass production of solutions, you invariably get everything on Windows 11 or a subset of Windows versions supported, and it has to go to the cloud because that's easier infrastructure. All of those hit all the boxes for IT because it's a low, foot, low footprint technically on site. It's a smaller footprint because you're doing economies of scale. It supports your very narrow view of OSs, but it does not scale to OT. We can't use cloud-based, we can't use scan-based, et cetera. Um, so then what you do is you often backfill with manual effort, right? 
and we're trying to find ways around these solutions to still be secure. And unfortunately, best effort ensues. And this is my notion of best effort over here. Trying to hit the things as they pop up, knowing that there's a potential catastrophe around the corner, uh, but really just trying to keep our head above water and not the flames, let the flames get completely out of control. The problem is this can cause significant gaps. Um, and this last one here, I know I uh, blacked out the name. You, you Google that in two seconds, you'll figure out who they are. I've said their name publicly before. I just, I don't like to, to pick on anybody, but this was a power company that actually negotiated a $10 million fine against NERCSIP for what was described as systemic failures to adhere to various security controls and policies and procedures. There were just holes all over every single process, procedure, by, by site, by location, by, by function on the power grid. It was, as I said, systemic. And that was their negotiated fine. Now, I'm not trying to scare you with fines. I'm saying if you've got that systemic number of problems, you've got bigger issues with respect to risk and, and security anyway. So what happens in this space? Because that's what people are trying to do. Here's the first silver bullet. When I was at Honeywell, um, you know, and again, because there's a lot of work to be done there, and so it's sometimes a challenge to do anything about it, we try and grasp at the easy button. Um, whitelisting came about in about 2009. Um, the premise was if the only apps and services that run, you absolutely required, you can lock everything else down. OT is set and forget. Remember, we never increase loop tuning or alarm management programs. We never add users. We never need new routes in the firewall for new and improved process control or IoT stuff, which of course is a farce. Um, there was significant effort to certify this technology on very many platforms. I was at Honeywell at the time. I know it was well into seven figures. And the reality is that there's still significant risk over and above and around on those systems, right? You could get in on an, on a, an approved account and escalate your privilege or use that account if it was a privileged account to do things. And so it was an interesting concept, but it failed to meet the magic bullet of don't worry about the inherited mess. We can fix it all with this one silver bullet. So then comes the second coming, about 2015, 16. It's longer than that. I know you think you said about 12, 12 years, Derek, from the onset, but the, the, the peak, the bulk of it has been the last five to seven years. And the second is the fly on the wall or the passive packet capture. Uh, the premise is I don't have to touch anything, but I can listen and tell you everything you don't know, everything you need to know. Now, they do get threats, malicious actions and attacks. That is what they were designed for. They also promise, however, that they'll get vulnerabilities in patches and inventories. I'm not gonna get into too much here um, about pros and cons, correct or not, true or false. But the reality is if I'm only listening, I only get that which I hear. And all you have to do is watch one Three's Company episode uh, or any sort of uh, you know whodunit sort of thing where you're sort of hearing something but without the context and suddenly you've assumed the wrong thing. Um, there's two problems with sitting on a perimeter and expecting to get more data um, one is that that's not what they're built for. Derek, if you don't know, is an avid scuba diver. Uh, I could borrow his scuba tank tanks and use it to nail a nail in the wall to hang my new picture, but that's not what they're built for. Um, and the second thing is, even so, let's pretend you love them. And I do love them for anomaly detection and for perimeter monitoring and their AI. It's absolutely cool. Machine learning is fantastic. Um, but they're not built for detailed inventory and, and risk analysis. They're, they're built for event detection. And the second thing is they don't do anything about the risk. It's like the alerting service that tells you, hey, you're being robbed, but doesn't do anything about it. Doesn't call the fire department, doesn't call the police department, doesn't draw a gun to stop the, the robbery. It's it's information, but it's it's now up to you to do something about it. So the reality is that they even know they fall short of inventory due to the very nature of the technology, and they're all developing probing capabilities. They are understanding the need more data. Everyone in this environment needs more data. We don't have enough information to make informed decisions. So the reality check is many OT environments have as many more assets as the IT side, and yet they have a fraction, if any, of the staff under our budget. There are exceptions. I understand there are well-funded OT teams. There is great strides in many industries and verticals and geographies, but there are as many that are literally just starting the journey. I have two of them this week alone, like I said, that are large, multi-billion dollar, multi-site in multiple geographies that have zero OT program. The second, IT tools just don't cut it. If you look at vulnerability scans, uh, CISOs love that they built a cool vulnerability scanner. Two big problems with an OT, scan knocks things over an OT, so you don't scan everything, so already you've got only half the picture. Uh, secondly, most IT scans are built around application scanning. Um, which isn't a bad thing, but a lot of the applications that they scan for, 
you don't have in the OT space. Software that you run in the, in the corporate side, they don't run on the OT side. Um, and a lot of them are pointing to the cloud for uh, threat and vulnerability data. Again, a challenge for many OT organizations, whether regulated or not, to be going to and from the, the cloud. Um, the reality is the complexity of the program requires significantly more data than most OT practitioners have. That, that diagram I showed of the ISA 99 means you need to not, not only understand what plan A is if you can patch it, but then subfilter to plan B for patches that are then approved by vendors. And then plan C is, and if they're not approved by the vendor, what am I gonna do instead? And I hope the answer is not just cross our fingers and hope. You need to be able to provide compensating controls. So what are we seeing for success? And I'm turning towards the future here. Um, inventory is the key component at the basis, and it absolutely has to be got, has to be done correctly. Um, when I ask inventory, and this could be a poll, maybe we'll put, I'll help you with the next one, uh, Derek. We'll put categories of what does inventory include, and the trick answer is that it's going to be all of the above. But the first category of inventory, people just want to know hardware and potentially software. Um, the reality is we want to know everything about the inventory. It's not just IP and MAC address. Um, it's about uh, users, it's about OS version, it's about installed software, um, but it's also about vulnerabilities and patches associated with that, and how are the devices configured? If I have a missing blue key patch, but I've disabled a remote desktop and a guest account, is it still a risk? Can I even tell if I've disabled a remote desktop? Can I get settings and configuration parameters off those devices? What about users and account access? How many systems do you think have legacy administrative or backdoor accounts from an FAT or SAT um, or from one of your outsourced um, support organizations that comes in to help you uh, manage your equipment on a, on a managed service contract? Um, once I get into it, what about my whitelisting or my antivirus software? What about network protections? Is there a firewall sitting in front of this device? Did my backup run successfully last night? And most importantly, do I care about this asset? Of course, I want to care about all assets, but in a given day with a re limited resources, I can't care equally about all of them. I need to know where to start my start my day and what can wait till tomorrow. And so I challenge you to make sure you properly understand your inventory because context absolutely has to be a part of that view, right? Now, the next thing I implore most people to do, and if you look at most tools around perimeter detection, anomaly detection, host-based intrusion detection, which we do, network-based intrusion detection with the passive packet capture does, SIM tools, which many people want to know about monitoring and detection. The big four is want to make sure you know that you're alerted when something's happening. That's all great, but can you take action? Can you fix the risk either proactively uh, or in motion, which needs to an alerting. If we don't have enough staff, we better have a way to pull the stuff out of the, out of the otherwise noise and bring it to our attention when we need it. And then finally reporting. Back to my, my uh, exhortation to have you not only track that you've done it, but be able to report and manage and monitor as you go forward, reporting is key. And the value, back to the point about the manual effort to harden systems, is if you can automatically connect to that and update that, you need to be always looking at real-time data. We cannot do what we traditionally did, and I still have clients today that we're slowly rolling out to, so we can one by one retire that annual hire of a summer intern with a clipboard and a spreadsheet to go and manually inventory the environment. So how can you do it? There's multiple technologies. I'm going to uh, make a suggestion. Um, an agent for OS. It is just one piece of software. It is allowing you to go directly to the endpoint. It's allowing you to be resident on the endpoint, and it gives you up to a thousand characteristics of the host. It also lets you manage the host. Now, this right here is blown away and scared a number of OT people right from that statement. The reality is agents are increasingly being used and are used in many cases uh, for some of those vulnerability tools or EDR, and they're not as scary as many people think. They give us the insight we need. They give us the ability to control and manage the devices uh, as we need in emerging situations. Now, for that's for the OS-based devices. For your engineering devices, because remember, we've got inherited this third category of assets and PLCs and relays you can use and leverage OT engineering. Um, many organizations, many vendor offerings include what we call um, profiling tools. And a profiling is basically a mimic or a copy of what the vendor is already doing. The Rockwell Asset Center publishes all of their commands and the protocol and the port you need to talk to a Rockwell rack and pull back all of its cards, including firmware and serial number and hardware. Why wouldn't we leverage that? The PLC is expecting to hear from 
uh, from an IP with those questions. It's engineered to respond to those questions. And if you're doing it very uh, in line with exactly what they do, you are one or two queries a day for a 12 hour refresh on your information relative to the hundreds of times HMIs and engineering stations are talking to that PLC anyway. It's an absolutely minimal impact for maximum insight. And then you want to pull in as much data as co additional context as, as possible. So Verve, we recommend our clients start with an automated inventory, agent and agent list to get to their OS, their networking and their embedded devices. And then I want you at the database to map vulnerabilities. If I can map offline from OT without scan based, I get much better coverage and I get much better frequency of updates. I can also then bring in patch information because I'm resident on the devices and pulling everything the, the management tools do. I have the entire configuration of these devices. I can pull in users. We found uh, one of the biggest Delta V installations in the world. The other day, we found 47 dormant admin accounts, which proved that their offboarding was completely broken. Every last one of them belonged to people who no longer work there. Um, bringing in your uh, compensating controls around antivirus whitelisting your backup status uh, and then into intrusion detection. This can be the packet based. Um, we work with a number of them to pull that data in and contextualize it relative to everything else. Could be host based, which informs your incident response capabilities. So really you need to build what we call a three dimensional view of the asset. If you can have a real time three dimensional view of the asset, you're now empowered to make informed decisions in emerging situations with clarity. So you take that data and you build an architecture that allows you to see multiple sites from a single view. This is where we really solve the problem of not enough headcount in unicorns and answer the question of IT or OT, the answer is both. Um, we need the ability for uh, a central team to be able to analyze risk across multiple sites. We need this team to be able to devise a plan that is consistent for the sites. And we need this team to be empowered to help to automate as much as possible so that the sites are minimally impacted by having to run around and do research or site to site, system by system, et cetera. Um, because we recommend the automatic update, we are seeing a real time control feedback loop, just like in the plant itself. We're able to look at the view of risk. We're able to analyze uh, what we want to do. We're able to take action. We're able to see those actions happen and come back into the resulting view. It's just like a loop tuning exercise in a, in a process plan. Now, I wanted to give you an example of it, what this means. Um, you take these together, you've got a deep asset inventory, and then you can apply context. Imagine if you will, instead of just a raw list of vulnerabilities, I could say, here's your list of vulnerabilities, and now let's filter it by criticality of the vulnerability and subfilter it by the impact of the asset. So I'm only going to look at critical risk on what we have operationally deemed as a high impact asset. And now I've gone from hundreds or thousands of risks down to a, you know dozens or a couple hundred. But then I can further filter that to say, okay, instead of just critical risk on high impact assets of this category, how many failed their backup last night or how many don't have whitelisting in lockdown mode? I'm now starting to get to the meat. I'm now driving through the noise to contextual risk that I absolutely need to accelerate to the top of my list. And that's driven by automated asset and information gathering, the architecture to pull it on into a single specialized team. We can scale those scarce resources. Um, we can have consistent design and application of risk reduction be deployed across all sites. Um, and it also allows for risk remediation. Let me show you what it looks like in action. We call it think global, but act local, hence the TGAL. So uh, we're working with a global pharmaceutical company. They have tens of thousands of assets across 50 plus facilities. They have a wide array of asset vintage, criticality, and origin. They're, they're a typical OT environment that we talked earlier about, plug and play into the OT space, and then some acquisitions and divestitures, et cetera. Because they're in different regions and different industries, they have various regulatory and board or corporate security needs. And unfortunately, they have a shrinking headcount to combat security. Now, before, with I, when I remember the slide where I said, what do people typically do? Individual collection of tools that are IT, that somewhat ill-fitting, some get some coverage, but they need to be picked up, you know, and followed by manual effort and best guesses and effort estimates are sort of, you know, ad hoc after that. Um, Blue Keep came along and they launched a project to re respond to it. <clears throat> Dozens of people in spreadsheets were used. Um, updates were tracked manually because that's the method that they had. There were multiple meetings over the following days and weeks. Now, originally, originally there was, you know, 10 or 12 people. Shortly after there was, you know, 15 to 20. 
the numbers started to break down over time as they sort of got into a rhythm and, and less and less work needed to be done. But basically, um, they did have lots of people pulled from their day jobs. When I say no concrete understanding of scope, it's because when they looked at the spreadsheet and they realized that the lack of data they had in the inventory, they didn't have owners or locations, physical locations on many of these devices. They could infer some of that, at least the, the location, but they were actually using a remote desktop to connect into assets and then enumerating what was installed for software and guessing that if that had Maximo on it, we should go talk to the Maximo team. They might know who owns the server. And that's why I said there wasn't a real concrete understanding of scope. Um, many guesses and assumptions were made, like I said, about owner, but also the vintage of the asset or its criticality. And the manual patch process started uh, for this company. Uh, manual tracking also began of the patching because they didn't have a single sort of view into multiple sites, et cetera. Um, there was no realistic, uh, sorry, no realistic option for the application of compensating controls. When you think of Bluekeep and you don't want to apply the patch, you could disable remote desktop. If you're talking about an HMI that's staffed 24 hours a day, why need your remote desktop on it? You probably don't. Let's take that risk vector out and suddenly Bluekeep is at least not mitigated, but certainly not a, a big concern on the device anymore. The total effort from multiple staff deferred from day jobs, they tracked their internal burn rate and the hours that people spent on this job. They did not release the number publicly, but I do know the order of magnitude. And so let's pretend each of these is a unit of measure. And you can see that there's 10 units of measure here that was their experience responding in the traditional method. Like I said, the tried and true OT practice uh, against Blue Keep. Uh, one year later, Log4j comes out. Um, they've done that same architecture that I showed you. They've got a central team. They've got visibility into all sites. They have the ability to, to queue up automated tasks very under OT. By the way, when I say automated tasks, I'm not saying run out and patch something or reboot a system without OT being involved. What I'm saying is um, you can do lots of prep work and prepare and then when you get to the last mile, you involve OT and say, hey, here's a list of systems at your site that need attention. And when they get to that system, there's a little flashing light that tells them, can I do this? Um, and it makes it very, very easy for OT to, to, to participate. They get to be the last mile oversight. Big Brother doesn't reach in, but we have much better consistent application and automation. So that's what this client did when Log4j came out. That essential team that a multi-dimensional view of all assets. They knew an accurate, an accurate list of in scope by type, location, criticality, owner, function, who was about to go in outage, who was in turnaround, you name it. Uh, the prep work for this team was they, they used their, their agent-based technology to deploy a local profiling tool. They weren't scanning across the network. They didn't have to find scan points and weren't consuming bandwidth. Um, they deployed to all OS assets. Um, they then put in a log4j specific dashboard of that central reporting to populate the results from the scanning tool. Um, and they also added some host-based intrusion detection alerts to see if anything was happening relative to log4j behavior while they were running around and patching and connect, uh, correcting, et cetera. So they had three really sort of immediate um, improvements to the process. They were able to uh, start figuring out where it was. They were able to report it centrally. And they also had some safety nets put in place uh, to monitor while they were getting around to it. The patching team began deploying files and began testing. So they preloaded on, say, Windows 2012. Uh, they picked a few domain controllers that were low impact in the DMZ to test and baking in for a day or two. And while that was baking, they were, you know, deploying the files, but not necessarily executing on other systems, testing other versions. And they sort of did this very staged parallel approach to test and watch, then, you know, sort of go to the next level of criticality, et cetera. Um, Non-patch systems, they were tuned to minimize risk by compensating controls, like deleting library files or unused the non-necessary software that housed the, the log4j libraries in the first place. And all progress is reported in multiple live dashboards. The total effort was only three core staff, but look at the difference in spend, okay? In units of measure, this is the same unit of measure. This is the one from before. This is the one now. And when you start to show that capability, and by the way, this is only shown when you have the ability to track that effort and show what you're doing. Um, this is where the future of OT security is going. It's not a big brother. It's not a one size fits all. It's not an either IT or OT. It's a collaborative effort between the two organizations. So my conclusion, um, OT security risk is not as hard as everyone thinks. It really isn't. It's basic, simple tackling and blocking. Yes, there are bigger ramifications. Yes, there are political and cultural things to overcome, but the actual work is not insurmountable. The reality is it's not going away. It's getting worse. We cannot continue to avoid it. The key challenges are you need context. I can't stress this enough, not just data. 
a raw list of vulnerabilities doesn't do anything. I walked into a plant manager's office one day to do an assessment. He said, you're going to tell me I don't patch and I don't change passwords. How the hell does that help me get any better? The answer is absolutely correct. Without context and, and a path forward, um, I'm not much help. We need to act on risk, not just report in an OT safe way. And we need to track progress. So a solution must be rich in information, not just data, allow you to act, not just plan A, but B, C, or D, and it needs to be continually updated. I believe that's, yep, that's where I end, Derek. I was trying to finish right around the hour. I know we've got 90, but you did want to do some draws and some people have to peel at the hour for lunchtime. I yeah. see some yeah. questions yeah. up there. So well, why don't we go ahead and turn to questions or comments? I hope that was worthwhile. Yeah, no, that was great. And you've got, definitely got, uh, you've got questions. So um, we will, um, we will get to, we'll spend the prize pretty soon, but let's go ahead and get some questions out. There was a little bit of um, sort of asking for some clarity. So just reminding everybody, um, we will run the prize wheel here in let's say five minutes or so, uh, five to 10 minutes. And um, so you can still get a question in. And after that, you know, feel free to continue to ask questions. Certainly I've seen a lot of sort of customer service questions. Our team is all on, we're glad to answer those. However, uh, we will have to run the prize bill here shortly and that'll be sort of the end of that for today. Um, we got some upcoming events. We're doing a replay next week uh, of a sort of event that was pretty unusual and interesting talking about tabletop exercise. Um, and uh, so we're gonna replay that one uh, due to popular demand. And then we've got uh, CSA fellow, uh, Jim Gilson coming on uh, on September 21st. So two two really uh, good events, one, one replay, one live. Um, all right, let's do uh, one last poll for the day, giving our, uh, team enough time to work on getting everybody, hopefully everybody's questions into the into the wheel. Um, so here is the poll. Which of these technologies are you currently using in an ICS OT environment? And so this is, uh, you yeah, know, more of the same, right? Gathering data, see what you guys uh, are all doing. And um, thank you for such a high level of participation in these polls. It's 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 pretty amazing. We, we really look at these as uh, sort of a very interesting leading indicator of things from a diverse group. You know, we, we know the makeup of this group is diverse. And so um, it's, uh, it's a nice reflection. I'll give this another minute. I see uh, more votes are still coming in. You know, this is a really interesting question. I, I would definitely like to ask, uh, ask people to vote on this one uh, if you haven't already. Um, is one we're sort of looking at a lot and uh, what kind of technology, and we're looking at also to where people think they're getting the best returns, but but what kind of technology are people uh, putting in in sort of this, this category? Um, all right, I'm gonna go close it out and I will share it real quick and take a look at that, Rick. I don't know if you'll have any comments mm -hmm. on this, but... Uh, no, that's uh, that's what we typically see. A lot of firewalls and segmentation. We're we're doing lots of segmentation right now. It's probably the busiest department in our in our team right now. Um, so yeah, pretty interesting. And intrusion detection people, you know, while we get started, I totally understand the allure of at least understanding what's going on on that perimeter. Um, but that's usually phase one. Phase two is let's get down to the endpoint and get rid of the risk in the first place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Network segmentation. If you've got a flat network, that's a good place to start. Yeah, uh, compromise everything when when maybe only part of your network can be compromised. Okay, so let's do some Q&A uh, with Rick. And so here's a, a couple of clarity questions, Rick, while you were on slide. So this is hopefully we, you know, this will jog your memory and you'll recall, um, you know, what 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 the, this person is trying to get uh, some clarity on. So um, ha under how, it suggests use of device profiling. The example went along the lines of if a device is expected to answer a couple of queries a day and receive significantly more, something is wrong. Wouldn't that be a case of listening to the network, which was previously stated as something that doesn't reduce risk under second bulletproof slide? Yep, no, great question. So when I'm listening to packets between a PLC and an HMI, I'm hearing command and control data. What's the set, the temperature set, the high level alarm, the low level alarm, what are the, what are the actual current measurements, et cetera. That's all interesting data, but it's not useful. What is useful when I go to the endpoint, like the HMI asset, the, the, the Rockwell's asset center, is I'm not asking it on the, command and control or the the, the the operational channel, I'm asking on the administrative channel, hey, by the way, 
I see your rack with five cards in it. Give me the information on the cards. Are you a processing unit? Are you a, a temperature sensor? Are you whatever? Now give me your firmware, your serial number, your hardware. It's the equivalent of standing on the freeway as a as a, a highway patrolman and seeing a car fly by and making some inference because I see it's a truck or a car, or what have you, than getting into the onboard computer of that car and seeing that it's this many miles and this temperature pressure, oil pressure, et cetera. It's a completely different approach. By doing that profiling and going to that endpoint, I get the data I need to then go map to known vulnerabilities because vulnerabilities are published based on OS versions and firmware versions, not on whether your high level limit is set to seven or 10, right? And that's the difference in the data source. Cool, okay. Uh, if that didn't answer your question, uh, you know, please please get, put another one in there, but uh, I, I think that might have addressed it. Um, where do you and Verve stand on advising engineering PLC on on advising engineering PLC code to include the recent top 20 secure coding practices? Um, our so our automation engineering department that helps to build those out certainly is aware of those and tries to help our clients to adopt them. Um, what we do today for you talk about code development. Um, that's something that's a little bit of a stretch. We're tangential to it because I'm trying to help protect the actual asset itself, the software running on it. If I can find detections of vulnerabilities for it through my normal means, that's great. But the actual coding of the PLC ladder logic and the software in it um, is something that we work with our, we, we inherit from whatever our clients choose to purchase. So we work very closely with, you know, most of the packages because we're exposed to them, but um, we're sort of taking what's been bought by the end user and sort of trying to work with it. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of discussions around um, secure coding practices and secure development lifecycle, and just uh, it's clear that anybody making things is also a key part of the ecosystem and needs to be, you know, needs to, you know, needs to to take advantage of some pretty pretty well known mature practices that maybe not yep. have been applied in this equally in this sector as they may be in, in, in have been in others. Well, one of the things like I gave the example of the three com using a BGP packet, but that was just an unintended, you know, consequence. There are and I always get this, I'm on my soapbox here, so stop me in a minute. Um, there are many organizations that want to be first to market. And so they're building plug and play that's nice and easy and fast, but that doesn't mean you're necessarily building security. When I worked as a vendor, we would bid to put the new control equipment and new logic and the new capabilities. But if we wanted to do security, it always had to be an optional line item because the lowest, the minimum compliant bid, if it didn't state security in it, was not bundled into the main price point. So until you ask for it, you're not necessarily going to get it. So I'm seeing your point that there's more coming, but it's because more people are expecting it and they're writing it into their procurement language. Yeah, yeah, and and that's a key thing right there. You know, this this has come up. We had uh, three OEM uh, leaders on last week's event, which was a you know a great event, and they're saying customers, you know, not making excuses at all. At all are leaning forward, trying to do you know make huge improvements in their organizations, but customer demand is huge. Procurement yep. language it drives yep. behavior, saying this yep. is what I want and this is what I'm willing to pay for and yeah, uh, that, that, you know, people say, why isn't so-and-so or why isn't this company or that company doing more? Well, customer demand will help them want to do more. Yep, exactly. Um, okay, um, with leveraging, this is interesting, with leveraging uh, engineering failure modes and effects analysis as a starting point for cyber-focused risk quantification, enhance the adoption of OT cybersecurity implementation since it would likely resonate strongly with engineering staff. I'd like to say, hopefully, um, we do have some clients where we're pulling alarm and event data in today. We do have some others where since we're connecting the switches, we're pulling failure codes and trying to figure out and prevent next time or, or, or the unexpected outage and downtime. Um, the reality is that I think that would open the door. The reason I say hopefully is I think that would open the door to skeptical OT engineers to let IT types and, and analysis and collection data tools into the environment, after which you could then get to the security portion of it. Because quite often failure modes are around, you know, physical equipment or, or potentially logic issues, yes, but they're sort of one step removed from what is traditionally sought after for vulnerability or for security, which is firmware and software with known published vulnerabilities are going to come attack it and exploit it the way it's been, been engineered. So I think it, it's a door to open and get the relationship building, but I, I think it's a start that needs additional uh, capabilities added to it. Yeah, I I, uh, I suspect there's there's some detail there that I'm not thinking about. I like the concept of using language mechanisms, uh, thought processes that people are familiar with. We're building bridges yeah. between communities 
And yep. so the concept of saying, I know you're familiar with X, and so maybe if I frame uh, what I'm trying to convince you of, maybe if I frame or, or draw at least lines to X, there's a familiarity and a comfort zone. And so that's not a one size fits all, but it's not a bad methodology. And it's certainly how I'm talking about risk instead of the latest security product. If you're talking to a board or C-level person, it's about risk and about managing risk, you know, all kinds of risks. This just happens to be a big one. Uh, yep. But using the right language, language that resonates with your audience is key, is a key communication technique. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, here's an interesting one. I have found that non-top 100 critical pipelines do not realize they are still a big target and would receive a significant reputation hit should they be successfully packed. Has Rick seen similar results or is this a one-off? You no. Know, um, with with respect to specific stats on, on pipelines, I'm not surprised by it. We have some smaller ones that have reached out and realized it was maybe too big of a deal and we're going to go push back. Um, but it's it what it does is it echoes my experience in, in the, the industry that went before, which is NERC-SIP and the power. And there was a huge fight over whether we should do this or not. And there were so many people that, yeah, you know, I remember going distinctly going to conferences and somebody would stand up and be a power company saying, here's what we did and why we did it. Now we've got this network segmentation and electronic security perimeter, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And invariably someone would put their hand up and say, well, how did you figure out which substations or which sites to do and which ones you could ignore? And they're like, you're missing the point. It's not about whether we're minimally compliant. It's about doing the right thing to prevent exactly that result. And so I have seen a very similar behavior in that industry. I've seen a little bit of it in pipelines, um, but yeah, it's a very interesting observation that that's sort of a natural reaction to something coming down the pipe that we're not comfortable with or not prepared to deal with is what other options do I have if, to avoid it <laughs> potentially. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, let's spin the wheel. Uh, we're gonna still get to more questions. There's more in here, great questions from some of you. Um, but let's let's go ahead and spin the wheel now. Um, so my team will take over here and we'll see uh, we'll see who wins. And just be ready, Rick. Now we um, oftentimes put your picture in the center of the wheel. Don't uh, don't try to follow it around. You'll get. <laughs> oh yeah, that'll be dizzy. <laughs> All right, let's see who comes up first. And thank you, everybody. And the list, by the way, we're trying to exclude people who have recently won. So we keep sort of putting only new entrants in there uh, to keep spreading the uh, the appreciation around. All right, Bruce R, congratulations. You are one of our winners today. Thank you for participating in the conversation. And so we'll reset this. Certainly at the end of the year, if not earlier, we'll reset this and everybody can win again. Uh, but but uh, we have been trying to share it around. And many of you have volunteered before we did this practice. Uh, okay, Lakshmi P, you are our next winner. Congratulations. Uh, but I, we always appreciate, we got the idea from you where people said, I already won before. Um, could you, you know, give it to someone else? So that was often too late to do once we'd run the event. So now we're doing this uh, based on that and uh, just limiting it to new new question askers. So um, Chris T, you are our first place winner today. So congratulations to all three of you. And thank you to everybody uh, who has been participating. It's been great. And uh, now let's keep right on rolling uh, with Rick. Uh, so, uh, Rick, what we have here. Um, okay, so at some point you said something that, that got this response. Uh, why would you say that the desired point with IC, within ICS is not to patch? This would completely defeat the point of OEM firmware releases for vulnerabilities being discovered. Yeah, it, um, if, if that came across wrong, it was either misheard or misstated. What I said was that there are those who question the validity of doing it in the first place. Most notably, the vocal person I saw at S4X uh, said, uh, well, there's just so much out there and it's so hard to do, why even bother? Why not go to perimeter? Why not go to segmentation? Why not go to recovery plans? Because everybody in OT has a great recovery plan. They know how to restore from bare metal. That's, that's, that's you know, OT recovery job one is when it goes down, how do you get it back up? And so it's a mind shift that I've heard in the market that I think is dangerous. And I wholeheartedly agree with that question. If it came across as though I was endorsing it, I'm, I'm actually on the side of the questioner that, no, that does not make sense at all. Okay, good. Good clarity. I, I thought that might be the case, but I wasn't sure. So I'm glad it was yeah. asked and you got a chance to address it. And your sort of related question on applying risk analysis in OT, the flow diagram eventually ends with either patch immediately or schedule patching. In the past, it seemed like patches were scheduled for never. Uh, in general, can you say that things have improved in that now patches are actually being applied on a more periodic basis? 
Yeah, and that diagram is actually faulty because there is a plan B, which is, okay, don't patch for now. Well, there's a, there's a, there's a subcategory. I'll schedule the patch for the next outage, which might be 18 months from now or when we get an upgrade on that system. But in the meantime, I want to do some compensating controls. Like we talked about repeatedly, I'm going to do something upstream from that. I'm going to disable a port or a service or disable a user or an uninstall software. Excuse me, in, in lieu of the patch. <clears throat> so um, I lost the thread of the initial question, though, about is there a circle back to the question was sometimes it's never. And then the quit. Can you just refresh me on the question there, Eric? Yeah, he was saying uh, the diagram eventually ends with patch immediately or schedule patching. In the past, yep. it seems like patches were scheduled for never. Can you, right. can you, in general now, have things improved to the point where patches are being applied on a more periodic basis? You know, it's sort of, yeah. is that what you're seeing in the field, I think? Yeah, we are. And, and you know, back to the OEM thing, you know, to be honest, we have one client that that that, that takes what the, what the OEM says they will take and, and does that almost immediately. Um, and then they will test, though, all the others, because here's the other risk. <clears throat> the OE, and I'm not, again, not putting the OEM on the spot, but the OEM says, I'm going to run this software on this version of Windows, and out comes all these patches, and they test the ones that affect the libraries and the components that might affect their software. But you're still going to have a whole bunch that don't apply to their software that they didn't, oh, that they didn't vet, but you own. So, for example, we literally had a client that had 1,400 vulnerabilities or 1,400 CVEs that needed to be addressed, and of the vendor-approved ones, they knocked that 1,400 down to about 850. Now, you as an owner have to decide, am I going to apply the rest of those patches and address those CVEs, or am I going to live with the 850 because the vendor didn't go beyond that? Now, that's the real conundrum for the end user is I want to do right by the vendor and support and warranty, but where do I stop and start? And the, the reality is much more complex than that. Some of those are security workarounds. Some of those are nice to have. They're not all pure critical security things. But you as an organ, we're seeing more and more organizations saying, no, let's just go ahead and test patching it. And they do that that sort of burn in tests phase like we're talking about. The reality is if it doesn't affect what the vendors tested, it probably only affects the host and the host needs to be patched. So those are actually almost arguably safer to deploy than, than the ones the vendor might have an interest in. So we are, short answer, yes, we're seeing an improved, uh, an increase in patching. But I also want to be clear, this type of approach finds significantly more risk than just missing patches. Uh, our our, our well sense client with the biggest Delta V install in the world found 47 dormant admin users, people that no longer worked at the company. So 47 departed potentially disgruntled employees. We found all sorts of versions of full-blown office as opposed to just Excel for looking at ladder logic. We found um, five dual home systems, four of which were running TeamViewer in a homegrown remote access scenario. We found that the group policy inheritance was saying thou shalt change your password every 90 days and was in effect, but that thou shalt use a new password was not. So the same password was being used for over four years. That's, that's, you I mean, patching is tip of the iceberg and it is probably the biggest pile of mess we have, but there is so much more in an OT environment you're going to find when you start digging into that level of context. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, that's, I think that's a great, answer that people really need to think about it there's context to all these things right i think mean, people are often looking for is this the answer binary you know things black white one zero and yep. the truth is it's uh, you know a challenge of course because it's not true you, most of these things aren't that what is the context yep. what's the overall circumstance what are we really looking at here yep absolutely um wh where is the fine line for not fixing a security issue that is less than the cost of fixing the security issue may uh it is less than the cost of fixing the security issue management tends to accept the risk. Yeah, I think I understand what that is. So like, where yeah. do you draw the line? And I, I had a note in there about the TSA making adjustments because what they're asking is maybe not reasonable. The, the if, answer that- If you had a $50,000 risk, would you spend a million dollars to fix the yeah. $50,000 exposure? Of course not, of course not. Yeah, but that's, I mean, that, that's that, the question though, right? Is that how you're interpreting it? I, it, it is, but I think there's another way to look at it too, right, is on any individual given risk, or let's say, you know, again, pick a particular patch or a particular configuration or a particular thing we want to do, you have to be able to calculate, is does this meet a threshold? And every single organization is going to have to accept some level of threshold of risk. Um, and what we've done for a number of our clients is we've taken a lot of those indicators, we've built what we call a calculated score. And so what I do is I'll look at every single asset, and we will be able to pull in different parameters because we collected them all. And what we'll do is we'll build a score per asset. And then that score corresponds to thresholds, right? And the thresholds then have corporate expectations next to them. Those expectations are if you're a critical risk based on a calculated score, 
something has to be done under a certain number of time. Now, the things that go into your score include the asset impact, the criticalities uh, present on it. Do you have more than one? Did the backup run last night? Is this a redundant system? Is it on a line or at a facility that would cause us you know, big harm or damage? And so all of those things add up to a higher score, which puts you in a higher threshold, which means you have a different behavior. And so you can at least get to probably 90% of your decisions by as an organization saying, this threshold of risk means we do this action at this time frame. These have you know, lowering levels of importance and then empirically define what is of concern to you, right? If it's, if it's a, if you're along a pipeline and you have something behind guards, gates and guns on the side of a mountain and it's a physical based uh, vulnerability attack, we probably don't care. Right. So but those all can go into a calculation and say that the actual risk, not just the vulnerability data says it's a nine out of 10, but my organizational operational hat is on and says, yes, it's a critical risk from the NBD, but I've got physical controls. I got compensated controls. I got low likelihood, et cetera. So that score drops way down. I've got a backup. I've got redundant systems, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where you need to take, again, the context to build exactly the, the, the response to that type of question is, where do I start and stop? Well, you need to have some numbers and you need to have measurements. And you need to say, you know, this high, we're going to do something, this low, we're going to ignore something. And of course, other measures in between. It's yeah, not just and there were other questions today. I think you've probably answered all a little bit of flavoring view, uh, but around this criticality and, and how that's assigned. And the criteria is multidimensional. It's not just uh, you know, how easy is it for someone to attack? How vulnerable is it? If it was highly vulnerable, yeah. but basically get little, little exposure to it, yep. that would be a little risk. So it's a multi, it's, a, it's an equation, right? Yep. Not a, not a simple, no, you know. It is. It is. It's, is there an external threat? Is there a published vulnerability? Is there an actual exploit in the wild? Those all add to your score. Now yep. me operationally, can I live without that system? Or when that system goes down, do we all cancel our weekend plans? That has to be factored in somehow, yeah. right? Like, because that asset versus the redundant file server, well, we'll do that on Monday, right? Like, but that has to be in there as well. So criticality is not in the eye of the beholder, but it's it's actually a combination of multiple measures and indicators, not just any one judgment, like from the NBD or from, you know, a safety system. Yeah, yeah. Um, and now I know uh, you, you, you've touched on things related to this and, and, and uh, I just wanna bring it back and I don't know at what point uh, our participant was asking this, but I, I know you, you would wanna address it. At the time that he posted these, I didn't hear anything on the risks associated with third-party access. How do you make sure that access is tied to a valid request and that each vendor can see and access only devices they are authorized to access? That's a big question. It's obviously, it is a significant concern area. Yeah, and that's getting into practical application of the technology I've talked about a little bit. We, we do a lot of work with clients for remote access. Basically, what we do is you want to have a very secure conduit, that jump server or that, uh, that, that access point. You want that jump server to be able to be tied to Active Directory. You need to make sure that Active Directory has permissions that are per Rick at Ver versus Derek at C, say, because I should only be looking at certain things. Um, and then you want to put things on like that we, that we, my company sells, and that is, you know, an agent on that jump server and host-based intrusion to look at system logs and event logs and tracking, but also alerts to see if different behaviors happen, right? If you, if you build those, those conduits and, and checks and balances for people only to be where they are, and then you add monitoring and alerting on top of it, then you got the best of both worlds. You're able to check. Now, it doesn't mean somebody's not going to get in there and try to do something. It doesn't mean I can absolutely prevent that, you know, at Derek's company, he's not going to give the password and credentials to his wife to come in and take care of something because he's busy that day. Not casting aspersions on you, Derek, but you know what I mean? We can only control so much within our world. But I, if I have unique users, I have Active Directory with multi-factor, and then when they get in there in a very sanitized, controlled, and monitored environment, and I can see their actions, we've got about as much control as we possibly can. Yeah, makes sense. Um, Christian has access to my, you know, my, my network, so. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, it, yeah, and that's exactly right. Uh, so does mine. Um, I might be, I mean, as you pointed out earlier, I might be underwater scuba diving when a critical, you know, or teaching a scuba class when a critical thing has to happen, so. That's right, that's right. Um, uh, I'm, I'm paused right now on the podcast slide. Rick Kahn, our speaker today, is episode 32 of the podcast series. So go, go check it out. If you want to hear more about Rick's story and how he ended up where he is today, we uh, we talked some uh, some months back. All right. Um, what's next here? There's still more stuff here. Um, okay. You know, this is sort of, uh, I think, one that's on people's minds a lot, and, and, and they're, they're wrestling with budgets and 
just any, there are people are, you know, they're starved for insights in the area of how are budgets and funding strategies evolving for the OT industry. Any nuggets there of things you've seen uh, that might, you know, might be a new idea for somebody to, to try uh, to get, you know, to get buy-in, to get uh, more executive, uh, see, usually senior executive buy-in. Yeah, that's a that's a really tough one, and I I wish I had a better answer for it. And it's what I touched upon at the beginning that you know I'm literally working with two different CISOs next week, existing you know discussions that you know how do I go to the board and ask for you know a hundred dollars, a hundred thousand, or a million dollars when I've spent zero to date every year, year over year? It's an infinite increase, and so the challenge is is very real. Um, to me, what usually moves the needle is if you can get that empirical data, like that type of contextual risk that we're talking about and how many assets and how many places really drives the scope of what needs to be done and i think that the first thing that many of these organizations are confronted with is they're surprised at how many assets and how much risk is there now i'm not saying you bring the whole list and say we have to solve it all but if you can bring some empirical data and then my point about having a tracking capability to be able to show that before and after of you know 10 bags of money versus three that's the loop back. So here's everything I've gone and discovered. I've got some empirical evidence for you. I've got context for you as well. We're not trying to boil the ocean. We're not trying to get rid of 30,000 risks. We're trying to get rid of the risks that are high, that are critical risks on high impact assets that don't have a backup, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we're gonna show over time trends as we slowly reduce that and get better in cycles over time instead of trying to, like CIS has the three stages, you know, there's the basic, the foundational and the organizational or whatever. And that's because they realize you can't go from nothing to everything all at once. But that feedback loop is how we justify and show, right? We 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 find this laundry list of stuff that's wrong. It's that's where the budget comes from. This is how much work needs to be done. We then use it to start to um, reduce the risk, and now we're tracking how much progress we're making. That's how we justify over time, not only back to what we're originally invested in, but for next stages, next phases, whether we're going to outsource some stuff, whether we're getting better, automation is making us faster. I mean, I can't say enough about that feedback loop, right? And, and it starts at that very first, let's turn the lights on and see how bad it is, and then use that to make a, a, a reasonable path forward, and then we're gonna track our progress and make sure we're getting returns on the investment and always tune it. It's almost, it's, it's almost unfair that you don't do it forever, and then you jump in when you have this ability to automate and really be efficient about it, right, as opposed to struggling, because we, we have many clients who've been doing their said, manually with spreadsheets and some are interns for 15 years now um, and they're dying at the opportunity to turn on this automated sort of approach because like, I have one guy who, who has this team of two responding to CDM requirements for the government around continuous diagnostics and monitoring vulnerabilities, patches, et cetera. There has to be a report given for each one of their sites every month and it takes 55 hours per site to collect the data and he's got over 50 sites. So figure the math out. How many full-time people do you need just to collect data and report, right? That sort of evidence is a start. Again, unfortunately, you go back to somebody who's never spent a penny on it, and they say, well, that risk and likelihood, well, what's a likelihood it's never happened to us before, right? That's the compelling, that's the compelling uh, event that, you know, I was always hoping, dare I say it, Stuxnet was going to be once upon a time, the word that no one shall say in the ICS circles anymore. I didn't do what I thought it would. Um... Yeah, it's got to be that word just going to be it's Easter egg. It just gets dropped in all presentations, but not discussed it. Um, That's right. So here's a question. I think I, I'll just sort of address it. it. It's a different interpretation. A follow-up question: The budgetary situation won't discourage talent for OT cyber, and I, I get why the question was framed that way. I would say the other way is there are so many positions that are hard to fill right now. OT cyber, you know, if if you're in that area and you're and you you've got you know, any, any kind of skills, you're, you're in high demand. If you're learning some of those skills, you can easily find some positions that you might not have been able to originally or to obtain, you know, in an in, in a ecosystem that's flush with talent. You know, the standard might be, I hate to say it, higher, more, more experience. There are people coming straight out of uh, programs and getting incredibly well-paid jobs because there's no one else to fill that position. And they're basically being adopted. I know of one case recently where the hiring manager said, we're going to train them. I mean, they, they, they just, they've, they've got a lot of skill sets that we ascertained, not experience, but skill sets and sort of a, a ability to acquire new knowledge. And we're going to have to train them because we can't fill this position with somebody that's got four or five, six years experience in the space. They're not out there. So there's a lot of opportunity. It is true that at a company, if the budget is low, they're having trouble filling with qualified people because, well, we only can pay X. HR says we can only pay X for that position. Like, well, 
you're going to have trouble ever filling it then. That's an HR, you know, pay band issue sometimes that is out of alignment. Yeah. I don't know if you have anything you'd add to that, but. No, and, and, and just in general, like, I mean, I talk about efficiencies gained and it's not like, you know, we're trying to put people out of a job. You got to remember that in that case study I showed you, that was people that were supposed to be doing engineering jobs being diverted to doing patching and security jobs, right? And we don't, we don't want to maximize that. We want to minimize that. And the converse, to your point, is we have a power client that hires great grads right out of school and they think they're going to some big cool power company and the you know headquartered in the woodlands and they get there and they 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 troll third-party websites for security updates to be NERCSIP compliant that's boring as crap right so to your point there's so much that could be done and automated taken off the plate and then that means we can focus on the capable people train them on the stuff that really matters and have them work on stuff and you're right there's just not enough out there. what was it like the job seek cybersecurity job seek database is over a million unfulfilled jobs like, yeah, there's some different statistics out there. We're going to start to gather some for our, you know, the OT specific space. The overall cyber, I've seen as high as three million, certainly million yeah. to three million, depending on who you're reading, uh, that yeah. are un unfilled. And I know yeah. anecdotally in our space, hiring managers who are in contact with me, like this position's been empty for months, um, yeah. and we can't fill it. Um, yep. So it's, um, yeah, it, it, you know, it, it spells opportunity from an employee standpoint, uh, but it is an employer hiring manager challenge, there's no question. Yep. Um, go back to uh, sort of um, access control, uh, it's a big issue. We could talk about all these amazing threat adversaries that are out there and nation states, and I'm as excited to talk about these exotic, less likely threat adversaries when a disgruntled insider, uh, our, our annual report showed that insiders, um, non-intentional, like non you know, uh, in insiders that didn't mean to be a problem, and then insiders that actually intended to be a problem, those are the two top threat vectors. So are people integrating with Active Directory? Uh, you know, how are they cutting off OT, ICS, you know, control-related system access to the person who, you know, who's leaving or being fired or, or you know, is disgruntled? Yeah, so like I said, from a, Obviously, if somebody, you don't know what's coming. I mean, I was in Aramco headquarters right after Shamoon, and I had 37 people show up to an OT security presentation. You never get 37. You get between three and seven, right? But there were 37. It was because somebody walked in who had access and plugged in, you know, Shamoon, and off it went. Um, so obviously, there's no bulletproof, right? That's the first thing in security. But really, what we've seen organizations do and what we, 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 what we recommend is that if you really need to facilitate remote access, that it needs to be through a secure portal. And I mean, you can designate a box as your landing point and that box can be locked down so that it's minimal privilege. It can be integrated with the Active Directory and anybody who wants to come in has to have an Active Directory account. So Rick at Verve has an account versus Derek at CSA has an account. And then when I get to the, those group policy permissions, say that Rick at Verve can look at Verve software, but nothing else and the Verve IPs that are running, you know what I mean? And we can even give me an SFTP site drop my files into and it can come to the other side and be auto scrubbed and you know antivirus clean and I've got a safe you know network share on the inside once I'm in I can turn on all sorts of logging and capability on that jump box um, you know and I can I can make sure that only unique identifiers are used I can even open the times of day and on and group policy I can have multi-factor tied with that remote access login um, if people are physically coming you can extend or some of our clients in NERCSIP are extending our agent-based technology to their transient cyber assets so that those actual laptops are as locked down and monitored and managed and controlled, et cetera. Um, but I mean, there's only so far you can go outside of somebody who's allowed in past the front gate, right? I mean, so um, even under those circumstances, that remote access is, um, is is as locked down as possible, but unless that you know employer tells that employee they're done and that employer then goes and tells you, the owner operator that has a remote remote contract with them, that's where the breakdown is, the human sort of supply chain processing communication thing. And I haven't really seen a super cool way of doing that yet, but um, that's that's what, that's what as much as we recommend at least setting up to get started. All right, well, we are nearing the end. Uh, Rick, why don't we end on something for our entry level folks. Rick, do you think recent cyber grads are prepared for the actual workforce? <laughs> for the workforce? Um, I'm gonna assume this is purely a technical application I'm not getting into boomers versus millennials and gen whatever at all. Um, I think that that anybody with IT training um, will need to still come and take notes and be quiet and touch, do not touch, speak when spoken to when they're in the OT environment. 
um, if that's what the question is. Did I want to get a job into the OT world? I think they have the basic building blocks. I think they understand the technical nuances, but what is an art form is understanding when and where to do or not do in an OT space. And for that, you need to take your cue from whoever you're working with. So I'm sure they have the basic building blocks. I'm sure that they would be very encouraged and excited. I've seen some amazing facilities and amazing things around the world, the things man does with metal and resources and stuff like that. Um, it's, it's fascinating, but it's also dangerous because things can break and people can die and whatnot. And so uh, I think they're basically equipped. I think they're going to need to learn a whole other environment before they apply their school learn skills in any sort of direct method. But I would definitely encourage them to go into this into this uh, market because it would be very, very rewarding and, and I think very long lasting for anybody who's considering that. Yeah, I'm glad you touched on that. That that's I, I say the same thing to people uh, looking at our space and student groups. Like you talk about career longevity, uh, we're not arriving tomorrow. Uh, in fact, my position is we never security's not a destination that we ever like pull into and say, oh, we're here. Yep. And yep. so it's got a huge opportunity. And, and right now we're connecting more systems. There's more attack surfaces tomorrow than there are today. So we're not yep. actually trying to fix a fixed problem. We're fixing a problem that's getting larger. And so, yep. yeah, it's a great career opportunity. I think that's right. Come in, uh, ears open, uh, come in and uh, get a mentor. There's lots of people willing to be uh, willing to be mentors. We're gonna have a mentor program for our global mentors, uh, our global members, it's sort of mentor match program, which we'll pilot and then we'll hope to roll out on a, on a bigger scale next year. Uh, but at the end of the day, there's a lot still to learn. And, and when you're interviewing, I think the key is show that you want to learn, show that you're coachable, you know, all those things. And it's not yeah. about look at these certifications I have. Those are nice. If you got a college program or university program that enabled you to get some certs, it's great. Yeah. But not don't hang them out front to say, see how I'm credible I am. Hang them out front to say, see, I'm, I'm working hard to gain whatever knowledge I can, but I'm ready to learn more. Yep, absolutely. You hit the nail on the head. All right. Well, Rick Kahn, thank you so much for today, but also for the years of supporting CSA and the Calgary chapter and for doing what you're doing in the industry for over two decades. Uh, not many people can say that uh, in the control system uh, cybersecurity realm. Uh, thank you for all that. And uh, it's a pleasure uh, having you on the show. And, and uh, I, I appreciate uh, being being a friend. Uh, you as well, Derek. It's always great talk and I appreciate the airtime. We should do this more often. No lots. All right, everybody. I've got my contact information up. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out. You can connect to me on LinkedIn. Let me know how we met. If today's the first time we connected, uh, just mention the event and uh, feel free to reach out to something that we can do for you at CSA. And uh, I look forward to seeing you uh, at our next live event in a couple of weeks. Take care and be well.